Today, um, we have the privilege of speaking with a panel of experts on how disruptions in Earth's natural systems impact not only human health, but also all life on Earth. And this is the fun part, I get to introduce you to our panelists. I will first bring in, Dr. Potter is the Director of Planetary Health at the School of Nursing. Dr. Potter is deeply committed to climate change education, including co-founding the health professionals of the, of, for a healthy climate. Dr. Potter, I just wanna start with you. Can you tell us what is meant by this phrase we're using planetary health? And how is that different from the more common climate change? Sure, and I believe I'm going to be uh, sharing some slides, but it says that I, I'll try it again. Try it again. <laughs> Great. So um, I want to do use my 10 minutes here to do a really uh, fast introduction, a Cliff Notes, Notes version of uh, introducing you to planetary health, which gets to the, the answer to your question. Planetary health is an emerging field, but also an ancient field. We want to acknowledge that the indigenous people all around the world were the original keepers and holders and still are of um, wonderful planetary health knowledge that has helped humans survive for thousands of years. But somehow we got off our path. We got off our um, uh, we got off that path, and we began to humans began to um, cause problems. We began to cause disruptions to the Earth's natural systems. When there were a few of us, it didn't matter. But once there were billions of us, our disruption of these natural systems um, have caused uh, forests being cleared at an alarming rate, biodiversity uh, loss, which is happening at a thousand times the baseline level. Oceans are acidifying, land is becoming desert, soil, air, and water pollution um, are, are um, a huge issue. Recently, we've been learning more about microplastics, and they're now been found in placental blood, which cannot be a good thing. Rivers are drying up. We're having increased shortages of drinking water for, uh, for people. Uh, extreme weather events, we just saw them um, uh, with the hurricane that hit um, uh, Fort Myers in Florida. And I happened to be in Cuba at the time and saw firsthand go through go through and what it does to a community temperatures are increasing around the world with heat stress uh, causing uh, co problems for people and sea levels are rising so it is not just climate change that we are looking at it's really a multi-system failure um, I think of, I think of it as if you were just focused on somebody's swollen legs but they had uh, congestive heart failure and you weren't paying attention to the lungs and the other things that happen with congestive heart failure you'd be missing how to treat the whole. And so planetary health really looks at how do we treat the whole, not just one symptom. These are all symptoms of the problems and the mess we've gotten ourselves into. And all of them have health impl um, implications. People with respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases are disproportionately affected. We have seen firsthand uh, zoonotic diseases, um, pandemic, the rise of the pandemic, related to our disruption of natural systems and um, wildlife uh, human interchanges that perhaps didn't happen in the past. Antimicrobial resistant toxins and dioxin exposure, heat strokes, mental health effects, malnutrition, forced displacement and migration, civil strife and trauma. And um, I do want to just say from a pers personal experience, I had four different episodes of um, Lyme's disease in my family. Family. My son got it in New York City or in New York in um, November. He moved to Minnesota. He got it again in September. My daughter got it here in St. Paul in September. And my two year old uh, uh, grandbaby got it in um, uh, July. So that was one family having these four episodes of uh, Lyme disease. So we are seeing some shifts and changes that definitely impact our practice. So planetary health, oops. I went too many here. Planetary health, as I said, is ancient, and I want to acknowledge the original keepers of the knowledge, um, but it's also an, a modern practice in science. It's a solutions-oriented, transdisciplinary field and social movement focused on analyzing and addressing the impacts of human disruptions to Earth's natural systems and how that impacts human health and all life on the planet. 
I want to highlight two uh, pieces in particular. This is not just a study of what's going wrong. It's also a science of what we can do to change it. So it's solutions oriented, which I think is tremendously hopeful and really brings us to a place of, um, of moving ahead on this issue and is trying to solve these problems. It's also transdisciplinary. It moves beyond traditional health fields or traditional environmental fields traditional public health fields to include engineering and arts and agriculture and um, marine biology and law. It, the whole um, sort of sphere of human activity is involved in planetary health. And what planetary health acknowledges we, is we need a fundamental shift in how we live on Earth, what we're calling a great transition. And achieving this great transition will require rapid, and deep structural changes across most dimensions of human activity. So it's not just running around, putting out fires, literally, really looking at how do we solve this problem, now this problem, now this problem. It's going way upstream to say, how did we get here? What were the human choices that precipitated all this? And how do we stop it in its tracks? So this is what um, uh, um, the Sao Paulo Declaration of Planetary Health says. And the Sao Paulo Declaration on Planetary Health was uh, released in um, April of 2021. It brought together the global um, community of planetary health experts and said, how are we going to bring about this great transition? And then there were sort of marching orders or a blueprint, whatever language you want to use, for every field. And this is what the global community calls us to do to transition our field, um, the health sector. We need to reorient all aspects of health systems towards planetary health. We need to have a nature positive carbon neutral care system before 2040. We need to focus on healthcare system resilience, disease prevention and promotion of health have got to be at the focus of our care rather than illness care, which our current system is oriented around. We need to ensure that there's health equity across all this transition. We need to be looking at social and, um, and ecological uh, determinants of health and ensure that green spaces and um, uh, recreational space clean air, clean water, clean soil, um, uh, nutritious foods are um, uh, basic um, you know, a, a need for everyone, that we give that to everyone. Everyone deserves to have that. So how do we start this? Well, we start this by educating our professionals. And there is a, um, we developed a transdisciplinary educational curriculum uh, blueprint. It's called the Planetary Health Education Framework. Again, this was brought together experts from around the world, transdisciplinary experts. And I believe there were 24 of us that worked on this. And we all came together from different fields. And they said, well, what do our students need to learn in higher education? Um, we came up with 500 things we needed to teach. Well, that is not going to work. That is that's not going to fit into, I know it's not going to fit into nursing curriculum or medical curriculum. So we brought it into five core domains. The first is interconnection within nature. We didn't want to just say humans need to reconnect with nature. We wanted to say we have to rethink our relationship to all of nature in that humans are nature. We are in nature, we're embedded, nature is humans. So whatever we do to nature, we're doing to ourselves. If that's not understood, we continue to indiscriminately cut down trees, pollute our, um, pollute our waters and our air. We are not making the connection that's needed. So interconnection with nature within nature is a key part. And then uh, we have to understand Anthropocene, what's what are humans doing to cause these problems? Equity and social justice is another core feature. Symptoms thinking, we have to understand how systems work and how uh, one change can in one part of the system can have unintended consequences in another part of the system. And we have to understand leverage points. And then movement building. Our students need to understand how to build effective movements and create change. These are not hierarchical. They're all wound together like a rope. So what you're seeing here is a cross section of the rope and how we how we move ahead. Okay. And again, I want to underscore that planetary health is hopeful. 
We know that we've got what we need. We know we have the solutions either in our minds or they're already developed. We have to find each other. We have to network. We have to connect, uh, link our arms and work together to create the future that's possible. It's absolutely possible. And not it's not going to be going back to what we had. It's going to be going forward to a future that works for everyone. So I invite you to join the Planetary Health Movement. I'm excited to say that the conference is happening next week, the International Conference. There's still time to uh, uh, register, and it's free to attend if you attend virtually. So I encourage you to hear experts from all over the world talking about this field. And um, there's references that will be available to you afterwards. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. That is fascinating. And it's generating a lot of ideas and questions for me, as I'm sure it is for the audience as well. Thank you so much for that. We want to bring, it's our pleasure now to introduce Josh uh, Fergan. Dr. Virgin, Fergan is a senior research associate of the Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team. Dr. Fergan works in research coordination for community-engaged rural uh, dementia and Alzheimer's research projects focusing on rural issues related to Alzheimer's, dementia, and dementia care. Welcome. So Dr. Ferguson, I'm curious, can you discuss the connection between rural health and planetary health? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me too. Um, I will pull this up real quick. And hopefully you all can see that. Okay, so I'll talk about this connection. Um, as was stated, I work uh, as a senior research associate at Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team. Um, but right prior to that, I worked as a postdoc associate at the University of Minnesota Duluth, um, working on climate governance and variability in the Great Lakes. Um, so I'll be talking a lot from that experience as well. Um, so I'll get the disclosure out of the way. I don't have any actual potential conflict of interest. Um, and I really want to talk about these three kind of overlapping connections. Um, one is that rural communities and livelihoods rely on natural resources and the healthy predictability of those cycles involved in, um, the, in, in planet's natural um, systems. Um, number two, rural land use patterns can add risk to human health um, of local communities. And rural areas have also limited... Uh, some limited capacities to manage risks and rural risk to rural and planetary health. So um, I appreciate that Teddy was more optimistic, but um, this one might be more pessimistic, but I do believe rural areas and rural communities do have strengths to kind of address and tackle these challenges. Um, the first thing I want to point out is rural is kind of this confusing term. Um, if you really think about it, rural is essentially the absence of metro. Um, and that's how we often defined it. Um, here we have a county map of the metro and non-metro designations. And what's really interesting is this county up here, St. Louis County in Minnesota, which is listed as metro. However, if you look at the FAR codes, which stands for frontier and remote, you will see that the whole northern half of that county would be considered kind of rural or quote unquote FAR. Um, and it's really just to illustrate that rural has a kind of misused definition, and there are a lot of regional variations across these rural areas. Um, and part of that regional variations um, comes with this connection between livelihoods and relying on natural resources and cycles. So many rural communities rely on the management of or the extraction of natural resources and rely on that predictability. Um, in particular for American Indian communities, they rely on a lot of these natural cycles um, for not just economic and substance purposes, but also as part of this cultural identity. Um, this also kind of has some limitations with it. Um, this often means that rural areas have limited diversity in their economies, so they are a little bit more sensitive to changes in natural weather patterns and to the environment writ large. Um, and these natural resources are frequently sold on international markets. So this adds a bit of economic uncertainty and price fluctuations. At the same time, we're trying to understand kind of the predictability and quality of our natural systems in producing these goods. Um, and these economic pressures, they really do have their own uh, impacts on rural communities in terms of health. Um, we do know that stress and mental health are already significant challenges in rural communities. And in these areas, we call mental health deserts, where they lack special access to specialty services that can really um, help address mental health in rural areas. 
And there's also increasing research on the mental impacts of experiencing repeated natural disasters um, and what that can do collectively to a community. Um, just real briefly, even at our, our own state recognizes that you can go on the uh, Department of Agriculture and see help for farmers kind of coping with uh, uh, mental health and um, also with rural stress, kind of this unpredictability of life um, and the economy and how that can shape how you kind of plan as a family. Um, internationally, we all kind of recognize that these impacts that climate has to mental health and well-being outcomes. Those tend to be exacerbated in rural areas when um, there's more of a dependence on that kind of activity for a livelihood. Um, and rural land use patterns can add risks that also threaten human health. Um, so uh, rural areas are home to some hazardous activities. Um, this includes open retention ponds, right? Mining waste, agricultural runoff from both crops and animals, waste storage, waste um, containment. Um, and this is actually why rural areas were like some of the starting points of the environmental justice movement. Um, Dumping in Dixie is largely recognized as kind of the seminal work in the environmental justice uh, uh, scholarship. And it really focused on how hazardous waste was being cited in Black rural communities in the Carolinas and in the South. Um, today, it's still present in rural America, um, particularly around oil pipeline and water access, and increasingly around um, agriculture, particularly industrial agriculture. Um, and this all goes to highlight that when a climate-driven disturbance occurs, um, rural areas are also more significantly impacted by contamination. Um, not only does it threaten vital resources um, for underserved communities like American Indian communities um, who rely on kind of the stable reproduction of wild rice, um, but it also has um, significant impacts um, to uh, other arenas because our containment infrastructure is not necessarily built to handle the increased stress we're seeing from flooding, extreme storms, and other forms of climate change and climate-driven disturbances. And this kind of impacts our planetary health when these disturbances kind of shake things up and um, change the way our natural environment is. Um, it's also harder to monitor and detect some impacts in rural areas also harder to clean, which often rely, requires more FEMA funding and sometimes the EPA. Um, and all of this can lead to losses in income and rural livelihoods. Um, sometimes those losses can last a few years. Sometimes they can be indefinite. So here's just a quick map to show you that um, these are the disaster and return periods. Average years between FEMA declared disasters for each county from 1964 to 2013. As you can see, our Red River Valley of the North is lighting up because it frequently floods. But you can really see that these claims aren't necessarily all in urban areas. And you'll find a lot of them actually existing in the, in the rural counties. And then finally, um, Rurals already kind of have this limit, limited capacity to managing um, human health risks and planetary health risks. Um, got to slide a few boxes around here. Um, rural areas already have what we call high social vulnerability. And social vulnerabilities are these conditions that make people or places more vulnerable to extreme events with a focus on these social, right? Um, well, we know rural areas are aging faster with youth out migration. Um, but we also know based on their economies that there's a limited local tax base and ability to attract more local businesses. Um, our rural areas are kind of declining right now. Um, there are a few bright spots, but for the most part, there's still this urbanization that's occurring. Um, rural residents are already less healthy as a whole. Um, there's a thing called the rural mortality pe penalty, um, where rural mortality rates are higher than urban, and it's actually increasing over time. Um, and this is kind of the cumulative result of less access to specialty care, mental health, healthy foods, a combination of some unhealthy behaviors and high risk occup occupations, and they're all kind of nested together. So when a climate-driven disturbance does occur, rural residents have less resources to recover on top of these existing community health challenges, which include less medical facilities and staff when a disaster does occur or an extreme event happens. Um, a lot of cofactors that add to health risks as other things become um, more increasingly risky to our own human health from the environment. And then uh, elderly and disabled um, populations have additional challenges, particularly in rural areas. Um, and this is really important because if you look as a whole, compare urban to rural Minnesota, 
Rural Minnesota has more people, has a higher percentage of people in poverty, families in poverty, people without health insurance. They have a higher percentage of people with disabilities. And there's actually uh, research that shows they actually uh, have a higher percentage um, of people on um, SSI and food stamps. So all those factors kind of lead into this situation where the dependence on natural predictable um, natural cycles um, are becoming disrupted and harder to predict, which is causing some impacts on economies and livelihoods. Um, the current and existing rural land use patterns add more risks as these climate change and uh, threaten some of these other kind of containments we have. And rural areas already have limited capacities to manage these emerging risks to planetary health. Um, they tend to be under-resourced and um, because of these current existing population, the social vulnerability of these populations, when things do go wrong, um, they tend to be more difficult to, um, I don't want to say correct, but to address in a more timely and efficient manner. Um, so yeah, um, just want to acknowledge um, the AIRP that uh, supported my uh, uh, research now at Memory Keepers, and then the NSF uh, Research Coordination Grant uh, on Climate Change Governance and Variability in the Great Lakes and all the rural, uh, many rural communities across Minnesota. I love you all. We have such a diverse state and it's amazing the research that you're doing in this and um, just the connections between access and policy and um, health is fascinating. Thanks. Now we get to hear from Misty Wilkie. Uh, Dr. Wilkie is a clinical associate professor at the School of Nursing and the member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa um, Metis and Dr. Wilkie's research and clinical interests are related to American Indian and Alaskan Native and Indigenous health. Dr. Wilkie, can you um, discuss this but building relationships with the natural world from an Indigenous perspective and what that means for planetary health? Yes, uh, first I'd like to introduce myself in my native language, Buju and Dinaway Maganadog, Misty Wilkie and Dijnakaz, Makwa and Dudam, Mikanak, Okadaki, and Dunjaba. My name is Misty Wilkie, and I am from the Turtle Mountain uh, Band of Chippewa, and I am from the Bear Clan. Um, so I do want to start out um, uh, by saying that I don't have any potential conflicts uh, with this presentation. Uh, and then I want to um, start with a creation story. So uh, many Indigenous populations have uh, a creation story, and so um, they're all quite similar, uh, but I want to read an excerpt from uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, because I this will uh, provide a foundation for uh, my next few slides. Uh, so bear with me, it's only a couple pages, small print, or bigger print. Uh, she fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there were a small a small object, a mere dust mote in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled toward them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather, loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Greatly she stepped from the goose's, goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was 
too far and after a long while he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while others looked on, on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative, and before long, a stream of bubbles rose from the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human, but then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back, and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks from the dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole earth was made. Not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animals' gifts coupled with their deep gratitude. Together they formed what we now know as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in Sky World, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. In her grasp were branches, fruits and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole from Sky World, allowing seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, trees, and medicine spread everywhere. And now the animals too had plenty to eat. Many came to live with her on Turtle Island. Um, if you have not read this book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, so I have a picture um, that includes much of what the creation story is, is talking about with the different animals um, and Sky Woman. Um, and so I wanted to address uh, the Indigenous lens of uh, building relationships with uh, nature. Uh, a lot of our uh, teachings come from storytelling, um, and the majority of those stories come with uh, lessons of respect and love and, um, and caring. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, talk about was global warming. Um, so I remember this uh, becoming a really hot topic in the um, early 80s uh, with the greenhouse effect, uh, and now we're seeing a lot um, more of the effects of climate change uh, as a result of uh, human harm and desecration um, on this land. Uh, so a significant part of our teachings include uh, respect for Mother Earth. You know, in, in hearing the creation story, uh, it really brings to light, you know, that this earth is is a gift. Um, it provides our our food, uh, our water, and our medicine, and uh, really sustains um, our life. Uh, and you know, one of the most profound things that I heard uh, several years ago was that um, every natural being on this earth can survive without humans. Um, but we can't survive without all of these natural uh, beings. And so, you know, in, in having that perspective, you know, hopefully it, it um, creates a change in, in how we treat uh, the earth that, that we live on. Um, so a lot of our indigenous ceremonies incorporate the four medicines of uh, tobacco, sage, and sweetgrass, um, and cedar. Uh, and um, these are gifts that the earth uh, provide, and because they are gifts, uh, traditionally we aren't supposed to sell them. Um, they are gifted to us, and so we need to gift them uh, to others. Uh, and so um, 
uh, let me move on to the next one. So in our um, Indigenous practices and uh, the things that we do and the effect that it has on, on planetary health, um, I think a lot of it, again, comes from that perspective, you know, in recognizing that the land is really everything uh, to Indigenous people. Um, it, uh, it's sacred, um, provides strength and nourishment, um, and it isn't viewed as uh, real estate or property. Uh, it isn't to be sold. Um, and so I think having that uh, perspective, you know, also changes how we care for um, the earth and, you know, that we're here for many, many generations and think about the things that we do to the earth uh, affect the, the long range outcome and future uh, generations. Um, so if we, as in the human race, uh, all viewed planetary health from the Indigenous perspective, I, I think we would be in a, a much safer place. Um, and so I guess in my opinion, I'm a bit in between Teddy and Josh, where I'm a bit optimistic and also maybe a tad pessimistic and also realistic, um, but hopeful that that we can we can change. Um, so one of the things that I also wanted to highlight was, you know, so, something so simple as removing a rock or cutting down a tree. Uh, we might not see the impact of that immediately, but when you think down days, months, years down the road, how that one simple change really changes the landscape. The wind blows through there differently if that tree isn't there. And so then what impact does that have on uh, what's left in nature? Does it, you know, uh, allow the wind to blow uh, more um, strongly and knock down other trees? Or if you remove a rock from a riverbed, how does that change the current of how that water moves? So anything that we do to the earth may not have an impact immediately, but it can have an impact years down the road. Um, so again, thinking of all of these things as a gift. If you take something from the earth, then you have to give a gift back. Um, and, and that's how we uh, carry on uh, that respect for the earth. Um, and uh, the last thing that I wanted to address was uh, Indigenous teachings uh, tell us that we need to think and act and behave in a way um, that is going to be beneficial seven generations down um, in the future. And so, you know, all of the decisions that we make today um, should be for the benefit um, and create a sustainable world uh, for seven generations. And again, having that perspective uh, really brings to light some of the things that we do uh, today, you know, uh, drilling for oil, mining, all of these things that, you know, uh, poison our water and our land and the effect that it has on uh, physical, mental and emotional health um, and what that is going to look like uh, seven generations down the road. Um, that is all I have. Thank you. I so appreciated that image that you showed in the beginning, just how it it really places humans and, and animals all like that whole relationship. That was beautiful. I really appreciated that. Thank you. <clears throat> So we're going to move to the question and answer um, some, uh, section of our talk. And these are all questions that we are asking everyone to submit. Just as a reminder, you can submit your questions to our panelists using the Q&A box um, and at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So, and for the discussion, just so everyone knows, we've, we've agreed to call each other by first names um, for, the, for this part of our talk as well. So the first question um, that I have here, oh, go ahead, Josh. You're muted. I clicked the wrong button, sorry. It's okay, you can raise your hand. We'll take that. 
All right. So the first question I have here from the audience is for uh, Misty. The question here says, um, uh, what is then the, you talked, touched just a little bit about this in your talk as well, but what is the understanding of um, uh, the approach to how humans then can fit into this natural world and where our relationship was nature. You kind of talked about this in your talk, but is there anything else you wanted to add to that or anything else that you wanted us to make sure we understood? I think the other thing that I can add to that is um, another teaching we have is everything in nature has a spirit. It's a, a living presence, a living being. So whether it is a, a rock or water or trees or flowers, they all have a, a spirit. And so if you think of it in that sense, we're much less likely to desecrate those things without having a, a second thought about it. We're much more thoughtful in how we approach our late relationship with nature. I think you, you respect it and appreciate the beauty that much more if you recognize it as a living being. Thank you for that. Um, Teddy, I just want to ask you the next question. Sort of um, the big question I have for you is, what is it that makes you optimistic? Why are you hopeful for the future? And it bring us over to your camp. Yeah, I will admit, I have some times where I think, oh my gosh, we might not make it. I have to be honest with that. But I would much rather um, look towards the future of what's possible than, than what is, is potentially likely. Um, humans have this tendency to be like lemmings. We just follow each other, even if we're heading over the cliff. And so it requires some of us, and I would say all health professionals, to move over and start building the new path that the folks that are going over the cliff can look over and go, oh, I've got an alternative. I think I'll try this path then we start to head in that future, that possible future. That if we're all just saying this is doom, this is doom, this is doom, it will be. There's no doubt about it. We will be heading down that path. So the hope is that there's enough of us, and I've met them all around the world, people coming and waking up and saying, what can I do? How do I bring my talents, my skills, and my abilities to serve this greater good, to serve this future that's possible? And I've met enough of them that that's what gives me hope. It's the people then. Mm -hmm. Well, Josh, then tell us a little bit about the people. The question we have here is, what is the role that rural communities have in changing the tide for planetary health? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think part of it is innovation. Um, it, something magical has happened a little bit with the internet in that, you know, suddenly you can have kind of a rural business and be connected to this larger market where you can, you know, uh, act, actively participate in. Um, so I think the first part is kind of uh, innovation. Um, and uh, not to throw too much cold water on it, but um, one of the biggest challenges in rural areas to innovation is um, culture, its mentality and ideology. Um, and we're starting to see that turn a little bit. Um, some of the, ref the resources I reference with farmers, um, I think there's been enough bad years now where um, we're starting to consider maybe different ways of doing agriculture. Um, and other places, maybe these rural communities are starting to pivot away from mining precious metals and more into recreation-based economies. Now that has its own growing pains, right? It usually produces wages that are a little bit less than if you were a miner. Um, but the goal would be to kind of accommodate a different type of lifestyle than mining, right? This idea that maybe if we go from mining to recreation, maybe our health gets a little better. We have more places to exercise and be active in the environment. And that only increases and enhances not only the planetary health of that area, but also the people living there. So I think it's innovation, it's trial and error, and it's going to have to go a little bit against kind of attitudes and culture a little bit, but eventually it'll have to kind of um, become part of that culture, which is really the long-term challenge. I think you highlighted in your talk that if we keep doing what we're doing, we're gonna end up exactly where we are. And so really branching out and trying different things to come up with solutions. So, mm -hmm. Um, this is kind of a question for all of you. You know, we're talking to healthcare providers, right? All over the spectrum of health 
of health um, sciences. And I want to hear more from all of you about how do we incorporate this environmental health, planetary health, this education into our healthcare education from pharmacy to medicine to nursing? Maybe examples of where you're seeing this happen um, would be great. Maybe Teddy, do you want to start with that one and then we'll go around? Sure. Um, so I'm a professor in the School of Nursing. Our School of Nursing has actually changed its vision and mission to be serving the, the future as well as restoring planetary health. And we have decided to uh, thread planetary health through our entire curriculum at all levels of our nursing programs, our baccalaureate, our master's program, and our um, two doctoral programs. And so that's moving ahead right now. And um, all of our courses are in, in that direction. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Sierra Josh, do you have anything to add to that? I do not. I don't have much either. That was great. As long as um, there, there's an opportunity, I will say that um, uh, healthcare professionals are trusted voices. And so people listen to us when we speak. The Minnesota Department of Health, I've been involved in doing some research with them. And we interviewed uh, health professionals across the state of Minnesota, asked about their belief in climate change. Did they believe it's real? Are they starting to see impacts? Yes, they believe it's real. They're starting to see impacts right now in the people they're caring for. And we said, so what's the, the barrier for um, you talking to patients about uh, planetary health or climate change? And they said, lack of knowledge. So we need to be educating not just our up and coming uh, health professionals, but people who are currently in practice about what um, planetary health is, what climate change is, and how to protect our citizens. This is about safety and protection. That's how you work it into a clinic visit of, I understand the air quality is poor, you have a history of asthma. How are we going to deal with that now that the wildfires are uh, burning up in Canada or California? How am I going to keep you safe? I didn't have to get into the politics. I didn't have to even mention the science. I can mention the reality of our air quality is changing. Similarly with drought for the farmers, working around mental health issues, issues because their crops are failing due to the drought. Or uh, solastalgia, which is loss of connection to the land because the land is changing. I mean, I looked at Minnehaha Falls, there's no water going over it. No water, not a drip over Minnehaha Falls. That's a sense of loss, a sense of, of, of a real deep uh, existential crisis when a place we love is, is transformed by um, uh, environmental degradation. So we can protect our, our patients by talking about disaster preparedness. We can talk about um, mental health. We can talk about um, their readiness for heat episodes. It's just woven right through our clinic visits. I think that that analogy you gave about treating the leg when it's swollen rather than looking at the root cause for why someone is having leg swelling or edema is a perfect analogy. And that is also a source of hope for a lot of things. As in medical school, we're redesigning curriculum and those things, the one example that comes to mind is around food. So food, nutrition, and health are all tied to, the, to policies and environment and um, access. And so if you can really show people these connections, I think it's it's eye-opening and then activating to want to engage in work that can change it. So yeah, I see that a lot in our students. Speaking of health, Josh, I have a question here that wants you to kind of really tie in this connection. We talked about rural health and connection to mental health. Could you talk a little bit more about rural health and its connection to Alzheimer's or dementia or memory loss? Yeah, um, so what I'm working on now, um, similar to you, Teddy, we're uh, interviewing physicians across rural Minnesota um, and as well as other projects. And what we've kind of noticed is that um, now there are areas of northern Minnesota that have kind of these predictors of vulnerability that tend to be higher than the southern half of the state. There's a little bit more issues with access to um, health care in some of the more rural parts. Um, so we're trying to figure out um, kind of what's that relationship to Alzheimer's. Um, we know the diagnosis rate's a little bit lower up in the north, 
Um, however, when you look at kind of other elements of this picture, such as emergency room department visits, you'll actually find that rural residents with Alzheimer's and dementia may be using these services versus something like long-term healthcare facilities. Um, and this is really kind of eye-opening because it's really showing the weaknesses in our um, medical infrastructure in rural areas. Um, and what that means is it requires rural people to kind of have to come in for this care. Now, when you're thinking about something like Alzheimer's and dementia, what that often means is sometimes relocating to receive services. So it actually, there are a lot of barriers to allow you to age in place. Um, and that's in part due to the limited infrastructure out in these rural areas. Um, other than that, there are also some health behaviors kind of associated um, with Alzheimer's um, that uh, may be more prevalent in rural areas. Um, there's a little bit more of a drinking culture. I don't wanna say that for sure because every rural community is different, right? Um, but there are some research that suggests that rural people may be more willing to engage in unhealthy behaviors, um, but really we're still just trying to understand this link between rural and Alzheimer's. What we do know is people who are struggling with the illness, um, I mean, they might not even have a place to stay where they can actually get that help. So that's our big concern right now. So more around like access to care and then worsening outcomes because of not being able to get appropriate supports and treatment. Yeah, and I'm not ready to draw any larger leaps to the environment yet. I'm looking at them. Um, we're, we're taking a peek, but... Um, uh, other than that, you know, there is some research that does show air quality um, is correlated with Alzheimer's. Um, there's a great paper that came out based in Mexico City that like clearly demonstrates this link. Um, but there's a lot of things in our rural areas that could also be uh, impacting our health in ways that we don't aren't aware of because we haven't really studied them that well. I think that's it, right? It's always been like the environmental stuff is over there and the connections to health are, and I'm doing health over here. And we really have failed to see where all of those intersections are. So it, I, I hear what you're saying, that that's an area that needs to be studied and one that's growing. And that's where I'm optimistic. Yeah. That's where I see a lot of energy. <laughs> We've got one more person in Teddy's camp. Misty, you're left. <laughs> I want to ask you the next question, though, that someone has raised. There are so I mean, like when you think about the issues that are in planetary health, they're really, really vast. If if you were to think of the top one or the top two things that you think are the most pressing, the thing that we should really be put, putting our energies in first, what what would that be? Oh, my gosh, I don't know if I could limit it to one. Um, one of the more recent that I could uh, address is um, uh, the, the mining um, uh, near the boundary waters, you know, and, you know, the same thing happened a, a few years ago with uh, the pipeline near the Standing Rock Reservation. And I think, you know, that's... I think indigenous people do things really well when it comes to the earth and protecting it and, and, you know, living by that, that seven generation rule and recognizing if we poison our water supply, what happens, you know, I, in in my mind, I think, you know, people complain about paying four or $5 a gallon for gas. I think if we don't change things, we're going to be paying four or five dollars a gallon for water. Um, and that's going to be far more expensive um, and detrimental to us than than a, a lack of oil. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, looking at uh, focusing on renewable sources of energy uh, rather than relying on the supplies that we're getting from the earth that, you know, are, are eventually going to run out. And, and yes, renewable sources are more expensive, but that's because it's still new. You know, if we're not prepping for those things, um, we're going to find ourselves in a, a far worse situation decades down the road. I think sometimes we have a hard, I mean, we have a lot, you know, we have a hard time imagining the unseen. And so we've never known a world that is independent, you know, and, and it's in the modern times, we have never seen that world. And so it's hard to imagine it and figure out the path towards that. Yeah. Um, Teddy, what do you think? What's the biggest issue that you think this is what we need to be focusing on? All of it. 
it's all one massive system. And so I would urge people to work on the area of it that they're they're most passionate about and where they have the most um, influence. It's all interconnected. Um, and so uh, to choose one, we're missing out others. Um, I do think uh, somebody asked what's biodiversity. That's um, the the the, uh, the massive difference of all the all the beings and the life forms that exist on our planet. Forests are full of biodiversity, different kinds of trees, different kinds of plants, um, different fungi, different soil types. Um, it is a real concern that we have this mass extinction going on. And you might think, well, I don't really care if certain frog disappears in you know, a, a tropical rainforest. When we start having our pollinators disappear, Josh knows as a rural champion and ally, what that will mean. Misty understands that as a nurse. What will it mean for our nutrition of our citizens? We cannot risk losing our pollinators. So we need people working up and down all throughout this entire massive system on transformation. I don't know if I can top do all of it, but Josh, let's give you a chance to weigh in on your thoughts on this. Um, similar to Misty, um, water and energy. Um, I think water is the number one thing. Um, you can't live without it. And um, currently we are using it and abusing it in too many ways, including energy development. Um, but that is the next part, right? Energy development. Um, uh, it's no secret that this is kind of the, the big beast we're dealing with right now in terms of the climate change impacts, the continued impacts, and also with um, contamination, right? We see the nesting pipelines that continue to sprawl across our country. Um, and those things degrade over time. So number one is water, um, but part of addressing water is fixing our energy dependence. Yeah, I. it seems really, really uh, obvious that you know, water should be what we should be protecting. And I think that sometimes it becomes more complicated than it needs to maybe. Um, let's think a little bit about healthcare systems. So sort of this like micro world of healthcare systems. What are some kind of preemptive changes, adjustments that we can make in our current healthcare system, whether it's healthcare delivery or healthcare access around that would really make an impact you think in planetary chain health? I've thought about this a lot, so I, I can kind of jump in. Um, I was one of the founders of Nurses Drawdown, which is a global movement um, applying uh, drawdown solutions to the nursing uh, profession. And we chose drawdown solutions that also advance human health. So there are some things we can do as health professionals to encourage um, drawing down greenhouse gases and at the same time improving health, human health, including a eating primarily a plant-based diet, uh, walkable, bikeable cities and really getting people out moving or using mass transit when possible, um, reforesting our cities, making sure that everyone has access to green space and um, the cooling benefits of, uh, of trees in, in a forested neighborhood. Um, those are all things that we can do right now. Healthcare institutions can work on decarbonization, and there's a large national commitment um, to that now through the National Academy of Medicine. You'll be hearing a lot more on individual actions we can take as healthcare organizations, but we will be working on decarbonizing because healthcare itself, healthcare alone, uh, contributes 8.5% of our greenhouse gases in the United States. Globally, if you added all healthcare institutions up, we would be the fifth largest producer of greenhouse gases um, in, the, in the world. So on one hand, we're trying to protect the lives of people. On the other um, hand, our actions are causing great harm. So decarbonization we're working on. I have seen, I, I think as a doctor, you see the inherent waste in the system, physical waste, like physical plastic things that we use and throw away. And it was really interesting to work during the pandemic when we could, we didn't have as ac much access as we can. And all of a sudden, you know, we were rethinking using gloves. Like when is it really necessary for infections? And when, when, when is it masks being a really clear example? And I'm not suggesting by any means that we need to go back to, you know, during that really stringent times of need in COVID, 
but just pausing and rethinking how we manage a hospital, how you do a clinic, what is good for patients, what is not good for the planet, and all of those things at the same time, I can see one clinic having a big impact just doing that, you know, because a lot of things we do, I think, I, out of habit. Mr. Josh, do you have anything to add to that in, in terms of healthcare systems or healthcare delivery? I don't. I think Teddy did a, a great job. I would just like to add that I, I would love to see. Um, I already know these uh, facilities are already stressed with time and uh, resources, but if there's ways we can get um, elder care um, back out into the um, into the natural environment, whether that's gardening, whether that's hiking, that there are risks involved, but that does so much for mental health. It does a lot to help curb the, the effects of Alzheimer's and dementia. So I would just like to see it more incorporated as also treatment, kind of go out there, be in nature, get some green space, go, ex go out and exercise for a while and see how you feel as well. There actually is a Park Rx movement, a prescription movement, so um, physicians and providers can prescribe time in the parks. In Canada, their um, uh, physicians have made um, an agreement with the national park system, and they can prescribe um, going to a national park, and it's covered for free. So there's a lot of things we can do. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Me too. This like, you know, we, I grew up camping. I was probably like the only Ethiopian family that camped. And you just realize just this, like, just this inherent need to be in those spaces, you know, how, how healing it is. We have a couple minutes and I just want to make sure that we end in, on time and give you opportunities to say any last words, but want to, yeah, any last, any last words or thoughts that you want to leave us with, um, just really grateful for the time, your work that you're doing, the education that you've given us and just the insights I've gotten just in this short conversation. So grateful for your time. This, I know. Anyone else have any last words before we close? I'll just say vote. We're voting for future generations that don't have a voice. We're voting for the other beings on the planet that don't have the right to vote. We do have a right to vote. Look at the um, women's uh, um, women League of Women Voters, the League of Women Voters, for information about voting if you don't know how to register to vote. Um, and Citizens, Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonpartisan group which really um, promotes vote, um, uh, looking at policies that will help promote the health of the land. So um, I urge you to vote. As you said, use everything that you have. So we'll. We'll leave it there. We, again, just thank you so much for your time, sharing your insights and how this affects our local communities, and then really helping us think through how we rebuild this relationship with the natural world and become advocates for planetary health. We also would love to thank you, all of our participants and the mini medical school for joining us today. I'm going to get this. Um, and so I hope this was like a really good a kind of introduction to this topic. We look forward to seeing you next week um, for the second mini medical school session. This will really focus on what we can do to bring about change. It'll be at the same time next Wednesday. We again will have an amazing group of experts that will discuss local and global health efforts at this intersection of humans and animals in this changing environment. So we hope to see you next week. Thank you so much for being with us today.